Michelet exemplified something the astringent Wilson wished he believed, possessed in greater measure than was actually the case. A generous expansiveness, the vast, almost lyrical, poetic faculty, vast imaginative faculty, the intuitive earthiness, the constant connection with actually lived lives, whether of an individual or of a mass of people. Without all those things, history becomes a mere series of analytical propositions, at which point, which is, I think, the lesson for today, when it becomes a series of analytical propositions, it loses the common reader. And instead of being part of our cultural mainstream, trickles in ever-diminishing form into the self-evaporating pond of the pure academy. So Wilson painted, but it was Michelet who, in effect, handed him the brushes. And Michelet corresponded to what Wilson thought, and I certainly, when I read him, imagined historian was and did, above all, writer as lightning conductor, transmitter of the past in that Heisinger sense, rather than as a comparative political scientist. In other words, paying as much attention to the effect of history on those who read it, see it, hear it, um, and uh, as simply uh, someone who actually makes available the documents of the dead. Um, to sway us to enlarge our time horizon, to deepen our understanding of what the human animal is, how we behave, how we conduct ourselves. If we're going to do this, Michelet thought, Wilson thought, I still think, history needs to look and sound less like newspaper editorials and more like poetry or even a novel. The condition of history's persuasiveness is the union of the intellect with the literary imagination. Thus, for Michelet, who assumed that what he was going to write must matter to the political and moral world of the French, must help them recognize usurpation, particularly Bonapartist usurpation in its second um, it, 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 its second iteration under Napoleon III, the purchase that history could have on the public, how it could shape our own ways of living with each other in a political community, depended crucially on the form of his writing itself, on the persuasiveness of the imaginative reconstruction of lost worlds, and finally on that tricky negotiation between the alien and the familiar, the alien as the irrecoverable strangeness of the past on the one hand, and its shocking closeness, the sense in which everybody who's gone before in some way are lost to us and in some way feel the same grief, the same desire, the same rage, the same joy that we do. When Wilson wrote of the pains that Michelet took to make this trick, using the word trick at the highest level of creative and moral quality, moved me a lot and sent me to Michelet. As the revolution in France gathers momentum, Michelet makes the decision to write shorter and shorter paragraphs, which eventually turn into one-sentence paragraphs and shorter sentences inside those paragraphs. And remember that the tradition in the 19th century, and indeed, uh, as they imagine was the case with Herodotus and Thucydides, was a verbal performance that actually children would sit around, listen to history being read to them, and it would not be dull. So that the, here for example, I've got lots of, well, I'll give you two very, quite short sense of the way Michelet works. How many of you, how many of you are as okay with uh, French, with French as you are with, with English? Okay, uh, not, Okay, I'll translate it then. Not, not all of you. Okay. But you need to listen to the kind of staccato music a little bit. Okay, so here's Michelet, and I'll, tra I'll read it and I'll translate it into English. <laughs> Should really be translating it into Dutch, but I haven't had enough coffee for that. Um, here, is, here is that weird moment between the end of the, na the National Assembly still living in, but guarded. It's before the fall of the Bastille, before the big uprising in Paris. And it's sitting in Versailles, and it doesn't quite know whether it's safe. You know, the, the, the Assemblée Nationale, which has been the Estates General. Here's, here's how Michelet, and you have to listen to it almost like 
chamber music, except with a very bad musical instrument, my voice. La situation était étrange, visiblement provisoire. End of paragraph. L'Assemblée n'avait pas obéi, it hasn't obeyed, mais le roi n'avait rien révoqué. Le roi avait appelé Necker, the French minister, mais il tenait l'Assemblée comme prisonnière au milieu des troupes. Mais il avait exclu le public des séances, here Michelet's image is coming in, la grande porte restait fermée. L'Assemblée entrait par l'art petite et discutait à huis clos. The situation was odd, visibly provisional. The assembly had not been obedient, but the king had not revoked anything, had not retreated. The king had recalled Necker, the minister he swore had started the revolution, but he held the assembly as prisoner in the middle of his troops. He had avoided, he, but he'd, excuse me, he'd excluded the public, the general public in Versailles from the sessions of the National Assembly. And here, this wonderful image that Michelet has, classic Michelet. The great gate to the assembly stayed shut. The assembly had to get into its debating hall by the little door so that its debates were behind closed doors. Riclot has a sense, of course, of absolutely sealed, sealed shut. Here's another little, again, short, a lovely piece from um, just before, again, even further on, when Paris is about to explode, before it's about to explode. Du 23 juin au 12 juillet, de la menace du roi à l'explosion du peuple, il y eut une, une halte étrange, une halte étrange, une halte étrange. C'était dit, un observateur, c'était... Un temps orageur, sombre comme un songe agité et pénible, plein d'illusions, de troubles, fausses alarmes, fausses nouvelles, fables, inventions de toutes sortes. On savait, on ne savait pas. On va tout expliquer, tout deviner. From the 23rd of June to the 12th of July, from the threats made by the king to the explosion of the people, there was a weird hiatus, a weird halt. It was like, one observer said, the, 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 the lull before the storm. It was dark and somber, like an agitated dream, heavy, full of trouble, false alarm, false news, rumors, inventions of all sorts. One knew something, and it, it's almost impossible to translate this last lovely kind of cadence, on savait, on ne savait pas. One knew something, oh, and then you don't know it. One wanted everything explained, one had to guess everything, to deviner. The same care with which the web, and this is <laughs> on with the lecture now, not Michelet, with the, the web of memory is spun, the illusion of being there, of the overflow between past and present through an intense, acute attention to literary form, to rhythm, rhythm and rhythm, no graduate student should be allowed to get anywhere near a PhD unless he understands the rhythm of historical writing. Now, this was the kind of historian I wanted to be, the only kind I thought stood a chance of mattering. And I've got a long section here, I'm not going to read it, but I, I just want to say that, you know, I grew up, um, uh, Rob very kindly and accurately referred to how important my father as a kind of reader out loud. We not only read all the parts of Shakespeare together over many, many years, but he also used to read Dickens to us out loud, which was... But my father had this sense in which Jewish history and British history had come together during the war and in the person of Churchill. And all I would say is that Churchill really does sort of belong. Whatever you think of Churchill as an historian, Churchill famously said, not altogether comically, that I know, I know that history will be kind to me because I shall write it myself. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he did. And, <laughs> um, but of course, actually, when Church, there, there is a very specific moment that Churchill, as the writing historian, that's why I'm alive, actually, mattered. And that is the third week of May 1940. And there's a revolt brewing in the war cabinet. Um, Churchill has only pretty recently become prime minister. 
And there's a rebellion of the old Chamberlainites, particularly led by the very brilliant Lord Halifax's foreign secretary, um, to do a deal through Mussolini by which the British Empire would be preserved by the Axis powers um, on condition that Britain uh, made peace with Germany and permitted the total domination of the continent. And Halifax thought it's not such a bad deal because no one, the, the troops were stranded at Dunkirk. It looks as though they'd all be, a quarter of a million of them would be annihilated. Britain stood no chance of surviving the war against this monstrous war apparatus of Hitler. Why not take the, the deal? Churchill, of course, was absolutely never going to do this. And he, the two of them, Halifax and Churchill, went and had their own kind of historical reveries. Halifax, fatally for his own, and luckily for all the rest of us, luck, Halifax went off and walked over his estate in Yorkshire. And he rode, rather than walk, he rode over his estate in Yorkshire. And he said, I could not imagine the jackboot striding and violating the landscape I loved. In other words, he didn't have any problem with the jackboot in Holland or anywhere else. <laughs> but he didn't have a problem with it in Yorkshire. Churchill, of course, went back to Chartwell and he thought about his own writing of the English-speaking peoples. He thought in not entirely sentimental terms about Magna Carta, about the Protestant Reformation, the Civil War, the tradition, call it Whiggish or not, the tradition by which liberty had been, had protect, been protected against absolutism and autocracy. And he did a brilliant thing. He summoned not just the inner core of the war cabinet, which Halifax influenced. John Lukacs, by the way, it's called Five Days in May. It's an absolutely brilliant, short, thrilling book, very much of the Michelet kind, um, records this. And we have Hugh Dalton's record of this as well, because the cabinet minutes are, didn't entirely record it. He, he brings the entire war cabinet and he makes a speech, rather like the famous speeches he would make to Britain, but this is just of the cabinet. He's said to have said that he would rather lie upon the ground choking in his own blood than do the kind of, make the kind of fatal compromise that was being suggested by the likes of Halifax. And at that point, Hugh Dalton tells us the whole war cabinet really thundered their fists in determined approval on, I mean, that is the point where, the moment where historian does change history, is both the writer of history and the enactor of history. And the next day, he sends Halifax off to be ambassador in Washington. And, you know, it's a huge throw of the dice. It's an immense throw of the dice, but it meant that, you know, my own Jewish community were not going to end up in smoke. Then the one, the one figure who some of you may know, some of you may not, again, a, a rather long quotation, but I hope you'll enjoy it, was, um, an uh, extraordinary figure who was really a kind of outrider in this group, because he certainly wasn't particularly left-wing. I'm not sure he was any kind of wing. Um, but it was a sort of poetically charged methodological, methodological anarchism. A professor called Richard Cobb at Oxford, who certainly, if not the greatest, is the most, was the most unorthodox historian I ever had the good luck to encounter. I, I was a young historian at his seminars, because there were no seminars on French history at Cambridge University. I used to drive through the sprout fields of Bedfordshire to sit at Cobb's peculiar, in his, in his peculiar presence. Cobb had gone through the penal servitude of the French Dr. Raditat, and with a very stony Marxist, Georges Lefebvre, at the end of it, he produced a book called Les Armées Révolutionnaires, the Revolutionary Armies, which were not, in fact, soldiers. They were the armies of the sans-culottes who were enforcing prices and political orthodoxy out in France. Once Cobb got out from under that ox yoke of ferocious ideology and relentless um, documentary extraction, um, he was off and running, and the figures towards whom he was sprinting were all dancing on the wilder shores of French writing. Raymond Canot, above all others, but the demonic Céline, too. Michelet was a kind of monster to Cobb, but he understood that he was almost as strange as, he, as Cobb was himself. Anybody who spat scorn in the eye of lapidary history, 
So Cobb wrote about the underclass, as E.P. Thompson did, but not as heroes, but as petty crooks, scapegraces, people who took an opportunistic ride on a revolutionary roller coaster to get even with their enemies. He wrote about monsters of cruelty, geniuses of evasion, pregnant girls throwing themselves into the sand, leaving their infants in a basket with a note asking for baptism. The dysfunctional, the unclassifiable, the soiled, the stained, the hopeless. And Cobb did this with a freedom of literary expression that was just breathtaking. Everything he did, he was Monsieur Les Archives, but it was translated into a kind of poetic intensity that burned itself into the imagination. It made Cobb totally impervious, in fact, wildly hostile to any grand discussions, of probably of this kind, of historical thought or to any theoretical framework for shaping the past, but it made him a kind of brilliant ventriloquist for the dead, a resurrectionist. So forgive me for this slightly long reading, but I, this, this occurs, and this is the last of my exemplary readings, um, it occurs at the end of a book, which is a tough book to read, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, force it on you, called The Police and the People, which is really about the, the attempt to provide food during the worst years of the revolution for the mass of people, but at the cost of political surrender to whoever was in power, particularly the revolutionary government of the Jacobin. And at the end of it all, I don't know when Richard wrote this, late at night, I suspect, um, in one of his increasingly more infrequent sober moments. And it just is the kind of writing, we all do it, where we don't need to look at our books or our footnotes or anything. We've internalized everything we've been reading, both in the archive and in secondary sources. And you just let, Michelet did this all the time, you let the past out. So here is how he ends his book on, on the police, the food, and the revolution. It's the, it's the la very last page. It's about hunger. I'll take it slowly because it is in itself an extraordinary piece of writing in my view. Hunger employs its own outriders. Those who have already experienced it, experienced it can see it announced not only in the sky but in the fields scrutinized each year with increasing anxiety week by week during the hot summer months by 30 million anxious eyes. The question is whether, whether there'll be a good harvest or not, of course. In the figures for grain prices on the markets, these are the clues, these are all the clues. There's always an element of detection in good historical writing. We are crime writers of the past often. Um, go on with Richard now. So you're looking for the clues about how bad things are gonna get. In the amount of movement on the rivers and roads, in the traffic of the barrière, the, 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 the little area on the, on the periphery of Paris before you pay your customs duty to get in, in the conversation of visiting countrymen, in the letters of country relatives, or in the discreet decrees of government and the unspectacular efforts of municipalities to extend the limits of their cemeteries, in the number of times two men carrying a covered object emerge from a hospital by night, in unusually massive orders of quicklime, in the dispatch of a commissioner to Genoa, Geneva, Hamburg, Bern, Tunis, Copenhagen, buying expeditions of grain, in the prayers of the pious, in the secret sermons of barn priests, in the cards of Diseurs de Bonaventure, fortune tellers, for whom famine was a better customer than marriage, violent death, war, or success in money, or in love. In the anxious faces of women, or the pallor of those who have already eaten dead war horses. In a sword worn by an imprudent mare, in the shadow thrown at a certain hour of day, seen from a certain angle of a certain statue, in a certain town. It, hunger, is something that comes with stealth, without fanfare, 
yet preceded by a thousand imperceptible signs that the 18th century marginal man could pick out, just as those who were in the know, the mayor, the borough engineer, and the members of the rat killer department knew that Gaston, with his broad brown and black back, the size of a largish mastiff, was just one of a race of invaders, a new race of giant rats already in possession of the city, waiting only for the single signal to come up from the sewers and take over. That's the way historians are supposed to write. It's not easy. If, if young, our young graduate students are not aiming to write like that, they need to find a different job, in my view. <laughs> Cobb clearly did not give a hoot for any pretense at narrative self-effacement. In this, he was a figure of the 19th century almost. He thought the objective voice either a pathetic, a, the, the sense in which you, you bring history to life from nowhere, that there's a kind of point of view that is nowhere, that is disembodied. You are just a kind of transparent recorder of documents, a re-presenter of documents. He didn't believe, he thought that was either self-delusion or professional fraud. There was a still small voice that begged to differ from this basis on which the historical profession was built, particularly the, the um, phenomenological philosopher R.G. Collingwood. Again, I, I was going to talk a lot about Collingwood. I'm not going to do this, but Collingwood, Collingwood made in his remarkable book, I think, The Idea of History, which again had a big influence on me, um, Collingwood, who was not a moral relativist, who did not take the view that there is no fundamental historical truth, it was just that we had always to take account of how we reached it and how we reconstructed it, and we should be unembarrassed about what the work of reconstruction was. Essentially, Collingwood made a crucial distinction between the empirical side of our brain, which goes hunting and gathering with honesty and expansiveness, um, for the evidence, and then the imaginative literary side of our brain, which builds it into something different. He described it as, yeah, he, he says something beautiful. It, he's very adamant about the historical imagination, and he's, he quotes Macaulay. Um, Macaulay, in a fine Macaulay truism said, uh, this is Macaulay now, a perfect historian must possess an imagination sufficiently powerful to make his narrative affecting and picturesque. And Collingwood said, well, that's fine. But he says, Macaulay's comment is to underestimate the part played by the historical imagination, which is properly not ornamental, but structural. The historian's picture of his subject, whether that subject be a sequence of events or a past state of things, this is all Collingwood, thus appears as a web of imaginative construction stretched between certain fixed points provided by the statements of authorities. It's almost like a, a beautiful gossamer tent, and the, you have to stretch the web of your imagination between fixed points of verifiable rock-solid evidence. But the web is the web, the roof is the roof. If those points are frequent and the threads are spun from one to the next are constructed with due care and never merely by arbitrary fancy, the whole picture is constantly verified by appeal to data, to evidence, and runs, this is all Collingwood, runs very little risk of losing touch with the reality it represents. So that is, for me, the job description of the working historian. And now, the end of my lecture, the dismal part of what Nietzsche called the gay science. What in hell has happened? What has happened to those legions of writers, to the unapologetic public historians, to the servants of Clio? Well, you can find the qualities of the job description, but for the most part in the pages of historical fiction, which in terms of the audience reading history um, it, are in the pages of Hilary Mantel or Peter Carey or Rose Tremaine or Colin Toybin, just the English, David Mitchell, 
you can even find this care to think about the relationship between evidence and imagination in some films, in 12 Years a Slave, even, I think, in Spielberg's wonderful film, so it seemed to me, Lincoln, just concentrating on that one moment of the Emancipation Edict. But those are all, of course, in The Last Resort, fictions, even though Hilary Mantel has claimed some sort of non-literal truth unavailable to historians. Um, I don't, I don't agree with Hilary Mantel. Either it's the truth or it's not the truth. The issue is where the truth historians in, who embody all the qualities I've been characterizing are to be found. They are there. They are there. One thinks of Christopher Clarke's wonderful book on the beginnings of the First World War, The Sleepwalkers. There are, there are, there are plenty, plenty of them there. But they, they are not, as Rob, um, in his Nietzschean mode, said, altogether massively populating the groves of academe. There, the obligation to uphold the paradigm of anti-writing, of counter-writing, of an inhabiting a purely academic language world that's made entirely for scholars um, prevails to the point that if our young graduate students wanted to write like Mattingly, for example, or Cobb, they would have no clue about where to start. And often, in the way in which Nietzsche had a very short career as a professor, this, the, everything works against a graduate student liberating her or himself from the kind of writing which will get you a job. Pierre Biodeau is right. Academia is overwhelmed by the need for collective self-reproduction. Professors recruit graduate students who then become his or her team, are trained as much as possible to resemble their mentor with occasional allowances for argument and variation, sometimes the Oedipal gesture of wounding the Dr. Vata so as to make a splash with a thin squirt of academic blood, tolerated prophesied under structural, strictly controlled conditions. The other rituals of the reproductive process, the academic paper with its mandatory positioning against whatever is defined as the reigning orthodoxy, the differentiation right, somewhat akin to antler display among aspiring stags, the conference paper at which daring is advertised to the gathered profession, the nicely calculated job talk, fresh but not combative, you all know it, and it goes on and on. The crowned PhD becomes junior faculty member, goes through the motions, dons the mask of respectability, becomes in turn the, arbora the arbitrator and operator of the same routine. Thus, another terrible word already mentioned, the integrity of the field. Let us now henceforth call it the fences of the containing paddock are duly protected and shored up. In the meantime, within the academy, not many people care about the challenge of strong, vivid, imaginative, forceful writing. The occasional gesture is made when an otherwise dutiful writer opens their account with a story, but usually it's abandoned for the pie chart, the bar graph, the positioning of your particular point. It doesn't arise organically from the body of the narration. And there are, I, and there are plenty of examples to the contrary, I, I have to say, but they're not enough, and they're only by established professors. David Kinniston's great epic of British life in the 1950s, another great example of how it should be done. But mostly, it's all content and no form, and the academic, the academy circles the wagons. The public, however, all view, go begging, and 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 the public does beg. Every time I do a signing at a literary festival or on, on book tours, parents come along with their children and ask why there isn't more for their children to get stuck into, or very kindly, and I, I, I'm sorry, it sounds horribly self-serving, I get thanked much more than I deserve for doing this kind of thing at television. There are lots of opportunities now in Britain, particularly, um, for young, for, for school children to engage um, and for historians to engage with this avid, extra academic audience. There's a terrific history festival at Chalk Valley in England. I don't know if you have one here. But I'd love to hear that in the Netherlands, perhaps some of you would be kind enough to tell me when I'm finishing, which is very soon, I promise, um, that history in the Netherlands has, has not become a sinkhole, that's not become something from which people flee, um, that it's not something which 
if you take it seriously, it's like you reduce your credentials for employment. This is actually a remark made by the present Minister of Education in the United Kingdom that it, you have to be stupid to actually study the arts or the, you know, the liberal disciplines, including history, if you want to get a job. Um, so instead of actually getting the kind of history that I've been reading to you and trying to characterize, kids, of course, who are wired for epic and chronology, get where do they get it? They get it from <laughs> the person whom, whom Wilson despised, from Lord of the Rings, from Harry Potter, from Game of Thrones, in the fantasy realm of myth rather than in the equally thrilling realm of truth. And the failure of the profession to think that any of this is their business, let history be Downton Abbey, let it be a, a, a stroll down memory lane, comes, I believe, at a cost to our shared civic life. Wherever you look at the fate of nations in the globalizing world, the re return of a kind of tribal nationalism in the epoch of corporate bureaucracies, bureaucracies in the rise of fundamentalist intolerance, the collapse, the surrender, really, of the Enlightenment project of pluralist toleration, in the blowback of post-colonialism in the heart of the European urban world, in the return of anti-Semitism, something giving me particular grief, notwithstanding Holocaust education, in the fate of the planet itself, where there is great, I mean, there are great historical environmental books with beautiful writing in the hands of people like Stephen Pine, for example. In issues of epidemiology, the tragic dynamics of revolution, the social distribution of the rewards and penalties of the capitalist market, in all these things, understanding is conditioned by informed action a proper consideration of the dominant matter shaping our own world and that of our children is impoverished by what David Armitage in his recent history manifesto has called short-terminism. I go further than that and say that the free world, and I don't sneer at the characterization of the free world, is actually impaired and weakened by its indifference to history, seeing it as harmless costume, escapism, or else, on the one hand, Downton Abbey, on the other hand, the impenetrable, endless PhD dissertation. We are weakened because we face the adversaries of our freedom are those for whom history is manipulated in the interests of imposed subservience. Theocracies of the kind enthroned in Iran, in which law is made by revelation, are definitively ahistorical. They brook no dispute against the word of God. Tyrannies or despotisms of the kind prevailing in Russia manipulate history to narrow the definitions of allegiance, pledge allegiance to our version of the national past, or be deemed a traitor to it. That Thucydides is screaming in his tomb when he contemplates what becomes of history in those circumstances. There are curriculum committees in the United States that have been caught deleting subjects deemed critical of what they define as patriotic American authenticity, substituting instead feel-good histories with the wrinkles smoothed out and the warts removed. And it was against that that the honor of European history was first flown from the mast of Thucydides' masterpiece. The whole honor of history, our moral self-respect, is to be a gadfly, an irritant to the complacent, a criminal nuisance to the official version. It's what Michelet was, it's what Richard Cobb was. To do, to make, to, to do something about this, we can't just write extended newspaper columns or editorials or even much as I've loved doing so and have inflicted this on you. We can't even just write, give lectures for the Nexus Institute, although we can support the flourishing of the Nexus Institute. We need to go on the offensive against oblivion, and our proper weapon of attack is that brilliantly told story, the web of construction over the fixed posts of evidence. We need to tell stories out of which emerge organically all the questions that need to be asked about whichever particular predicament we are grappling with. And 
Lots of academics, I'm sure, are here probably taking terrible offense. We need to leave the campus, everybody. We need to march out of the gates of the monastery and into the world with our inconvenient stories. So here, in the Nexus Institute, I'm proposing something, a radical rethinking, so radical it verges a bit on the Maoist, of what should qualify a student for a PhD in history. Yes, the dissertation based on primary research should be the jewel, the essential treasure. But along with it, no one should receive a doctoral degree unless they spend a semester, a third or a half of a year teaching in a high school. I'll do it myself. I'll start. Absolutely fine. I go into schools a lot in America, but I'm happy to do that. And even in other captive communities, prisons, young offenders, for example, not every day of the week. Let's not get carried away. <laughs> and there was another job description, which, without which you should not be able to get a PhD, the ability with software designers to create a website or an app that can bring these stories to a mobile device, a tablet, to anyone anywhere working in a Thai factory in a farm in Africa, anyone with different set of beliefs, a different kind of job. We've never had such powerful means of honoring the Thucydidean vocation of being an irritant, and yet assume that it's someone else's job. It's not someone else's job, it's, our, it's the scholar's job, it's working historian's job. Taking history out of the academy to the people, however, doesn't have to be a purely digital exercise. Amazingly, last week I was at the Weizmann Institute, kindly asked me there, um, uh, in, uh, of science in Israel, and the, um, the head of the Weizmann Institute Daniel Zeifman told me absolutely amazing thing. There's an extraordinary venture that's been going on for five years in which all of his senior colleagues, these are Nobel Prize winning scientists, um, have been taking their science into pubs, into cafes and pubs about once a month and talking about their work to a room full of half drunk people, essentially. Or, and he said, it's brilliant. Everybody loves doing it. That was his view. Um, and why not have a discussion in a pub about colonialism, about the First World War, about the history of race and empire in the Netherlands? Always remember my old mentor, Jack Plum, who Rob kindly mentioned, said, you he used to say to us, uh, his students, you belong to an ancient craft that began by shouting in the Agora. It's time to start shouting a bit again, I think. Otherwise, my friends, the atrophy will be irreversible. It will be. Our children's children, if not our children, will just not see the point. The golden chain of memory will be broken. The practice will be ever confined to a tinier number of scholars doing nothing but talking to each other in ever-diminishing numbers about less and less. While the world of the past will be left to the movies, the historical romancers who make free with the truth, and no one, no one will expect historians to be tellers of tales. There are many, many horrors. Anybody since I began, this is my last paragraph, anyone think of where a great novel in which the honor of the past has somehow miraculously been preserved in a line of an old song? I could sing it for you, maybe that would help. Oranges and lemon, say the bells of St. Clemens. Yes, lady in the brain. Where does that come from? You know. Yes! Stand up. 1984. Exactly right. It's all well. It's all well. Thank you. You're my new girlfriend. Well, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. There are many horrors in Orwell's 1984, O'Brien's rats and all the rest, but the biggest horror is Big Brother's erasure of the past, a wholly successful exercise in cultural lobotomy that dooms mankind to live in a perpetual present. Only that song whistled tune overheard by Winston Smith gives him a moment of pause to grieve over the loss. In those circumstances, not perhaps a futurist fantasy, history will indeed just be history, and we will have lost that attribute of our humanity, second only to the power of language, the incomparable treasure of our shared memory. Here's Orwell on Winston Smith, when long after matters have gone bad. Everything faded into mist. <laughs> 
The past was erased. The erasure was forgotten. The lie had become truth. Thank you.